we have here? Look at his yes, library. Oh my goodness. Welcome, welcome Dr. Pablo Brewer. Brewer? Hola, Serma, ¿cómo está? Ah, desde Argentina, ¿cierto? Sí, sí, from, sí. From Argentina. I'm from Argentina, from Buenos Aires. Very nice, Buenos Aires. I, I went last year, actually, I'm, to Buenos I'm, Aires. Jealous, I have family there. I have not been back in 22 years. Ooh. Oh, really? I need to, I need to go see my, my family. Yeah. Yes, of <laughs> course. My, my grandpa, my grandpa was born in Buenos Aires. Okay. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. You get, you probably, you guys are probably family. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> Making connections in tactical aid. That's it. Uh, so. Welcome, Pablo. Thank you How very you? much. I'm well. I'm very excited to give this talk. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Yes, yes. So, wow. so Pablo, Pablo was going to come join us in Cartagena, and I know this is a sore, sad story for Pablo. And in fact, he's the one that uh, made the introductions with Liz and with uh, Dr. Andrea Limbago, who will join us on Friday. And the two of them made it to Cartagena. Uh -huh. <laughs> And Pablo couldn't make it. There was a conflict. Pablo couldn't make it. Oh, okay. Very sad. But maybe you'll invite me back next year. Oh, you know, you have year, a maybe. Op open invitation, my friend. Yes. <laughs> and Pablo, you are our last speaker of the, this second day. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts so far on the event? I think it's a fantastic event. Um, I'm I'm a little bit biased because so many of my friends are are talking. So uh, Liz and Andrea um, are are definitely kind of at the at the bleeding edge of this industry. Hmm. Uh, and so I always enjoy getting to hear other smart people uh, discuss their problems and their challenges and how they solve them. Uh, the 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 only thing that I'm missing out on, and and Ed touched on it, is. We don't get to do Hulkon. Uh, a, a lot of times, the best thing about these are the side conversations you have between talks. Yeah. Uh, but I'm hopeful we'll get to do that in the future. And and I would certainly uh, love for anybody that listens to these talks that has any questions to reach out to me on LinkedIn or, or shoot me an email uh, because it's really all about making people and having those connections. And nobody has all of the answers. Uh, I certainly don't. Uh, but I, I think this is a fantastic, uh, fantastic opportunity for us to still exchange information. Perfect. And Pablo, you wore your recent PhD uh, doctorate. You received uh, congratulations on that. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm, I'm officially overeducated. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know that I'm any smarter, but I have one more degree now. One yeah, more. That's fantastic. <laughs> and you just started a new job not too long ago? I did. I um, actually this week um, I started a new job. Uh, I, I was with um, Accenture Federal Service, who was who's a fantastic, fantastic company uh, with a lot of smart people. Uh, and and I had an opportunity to come up that I, I just couldn't pass up. And so this week I started with uh, Helm Services as their Chief Information Security Officer. Hmm. So I'm going to have to live all of these things that I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> well, that's fantastic. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, the, the good thing about this event, when I'm putting it together, I realize, wow, I have a lot of really, really smart people, uh, uh, veterans of the industry. And they're over here sharing their time, sharing their uh, experiences and their knowledge. Uh, Stephen Moore from Exabeam, you know, he was the CISO during the uh, Anthem Breach. Yeah. And here he is telling us, let me tell you about breaches. The most important thing, you're not going to be judged because of the breach. You're going to be judged how you respond to it, how your communication. So um, I'm very, very happy about all of them and, and that everyone is here. So uh, a lot of information. I'm taking a, down a lot of notes and uh, it's fantastic. So I'm going to tell us a little bit about Pablo. Yes. Okay. Well, Dr. Paula Brewer is currently a principal director for Applied Cyber Intelligence. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's Not the only part that changed, Selma. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you changed. You That's changed. That's my fault. No. It changed this week. <laughs> it changed yesterday. <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah, I'm that's so not sorry. that's my fault. I'm sorry. Okay. He's so, at 22, so we we have to continue <laughs> with the with more information, different information. But you are a 22 year veteran of the U.S. Navy. Yes, that's, that's really interesting. Congratulations! Thank you. 
do you have something like uh, something you want to share with us about that experience? Oh, goodness. Uh, the only thing I can share with you is if you ever watch a movie about the government and hacking, uh, I wish we were half as good as Hollywood made us. <laughs> we Government struggles with the same problems as, as industry struggles with. Um, we've got a slightly different business model, but the problems are the same everywhere. And, and uh, you just get to learn them faster, I think, in the military. <laughs> wow. Well, some tours of interest include Military Director of U.S. Special Operations Command Donovan Group and Senior Military Advisor and Innovation Officer of Softworks, the National Security Agency and the U.S. Cyber Command, as well as being the Director of C4 at U.S. Naval Forces Central Command. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's a lot. <laughs> and... Uh, and Thalmice impressed. <laughs> of course. I'm very impressed. And if you are from Argentina, I'm more impressed. <laughs> because, you know, you're all Argentinos. Siempre destacan, no? They are always good in what they are doing. Tratamos. Tratamos. Yes. yes. So what is your presentation about? So I am going to give you a slightly different presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we might want to actually look at less information on our networks to make them more secure, as opposed to more information on our networks to make them secure. Oh, uh, okay. And I'm, I'm, okay. So the stage is yours. Welcome to Tactical Edge. Thank you very much. Okay, can I get verification, Selma, that you can see my slides? Wonderful. So uh, my name's Pablo Brewer. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about reducing the information overload for your security operations center analysts via an analog model for cyber risk. So uh, disclaimer, uh, all these views are my own and they're based upon uh, my research, specifically my PhD research. Uh, they're not the views of my employer. I'm not here as an employee at any particular company, uh, but I thought that this was a worthwhile uh, discussion to have. Uh, we're going to start out, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what cybersecurity is and why this information overload is a problem. Uh, we'll talk about the current state of cybersecurity uh, and computer science and artificial intelligence and, and what they can and can't do for us in cybersecurity. Uh, I'll give a brief overview of what information overload is and why that's a problem. Then I'll talk about cybersecurity frameworks. Uh, and then I'll show you a research study that I did by examining a real world network. And then we'll discuss takeaways and conclusions. So it's not a surprise to anybody that's worked in this industry that the networks keep getting faster and faster and bigger and bigger. Uh, the number of devices connected to the internet uh, exceeded the number of people on the planet in 2014. By the end of 2020, by the end of this year, we expect that there are going to be four to five times the number of devices on the internet than there are people. Said another way, in 2012, the IEEE held their Visual Analytics and Science and Technology Challenge, and uh, that year it was centered on cybersecurity. Uh, and it covered a uh, 40 hour period, one week. And in that one week, they had 28 million firewall entries and 38,000 intrusion detection system entries. Now, on average, most security operation centers have between 10 and 20 personnel on shift. So when you take that in combination with the number of entries, we're asking every analyst to read, integrate, analyze, and understand 67,000 pages of text per second. Uh, and according to a recent MIT study, each operator can normally ingest 0.00001% of the number of daily alerts they receive. So the networks are getting bigger, they're getting faster, we're getting more alerts, and we just can't keep up. The, the source for this comes from uh, ISC Squared, who you may know uh, from CISSP. Uh, this comes from their 2020 report on cybersecurity workforce. They say that this year in North America, we've got a 561,000 person deficit for cybersecurity workforce. In Latin America, we've got a 600,000 
person uh, deficit. Europe, 291,000, and the Asia Pacific region, 2.6 million. Uh, that's this year. They expect that to grow by 62% in the next 12 months. So the skills gap and the, si the gap between our cybersecurity workforce and what we're asking them to look at uh, is getting bigger and bigger every year. It's just basically unsustainable. So the way that we've done that is uh, we've dealt with that in the past is we've added automation. We've come up with new computer security tools uh, and, and we're starting to look at things like big data analytics and artificial intelligence. But let's start back at the very basics with what do we mean with cybersecurity? Uh, cybersecurity is the, the existence of three principles. The three principles of cybersecurity are confidentiality, which guarantees that only the initiator and authorized recipients can access information. Integrity, which guarantees that the message that was transmitted is the one that was received and that information can only be modified by authorized personnel. And the last one is availability that guarantees timely and reliable access to information. So it's easy to get lost in signatures and ROP chains and AI and ML and all these fancy buzzwords. But at the end of the day, our network is supposed to provide these three principles for whatever the core business function is of our company. So brief history of cybersecurity technology. First, we had stateless firewalls. Those were first suggested in the early 80s uh, by Dorothy Denning and a few others. Uh, those looked at individual packets without consideration for them in a context. And we found out that that really didn't work for us. So the next step was to go to stateful uh, packet firewalls, uh, which were also called next generation firewalls. I think we're on our fourth or fifth next generation of firewalls now. Um, and those looked at packets uh, in context, looking at what happened before and what, what's gonna happen next. Then we added some automation in response by doing uh, intrusion prevention systems. Uh, then we said, wow, we've got all of these sensors out there. Wouldn't it be great if we could integrate uh, all of their logs and all of their signature fires into one place? And we had uh, security incident event monitors and, and SOAR, SIM and SOAR integration. Uh, and now we're talking about artificial intelligence. And none of these things are helping us. And we're gonna discuss why that is. So every computer we've ever touched is based on Alan Turing's machine uh, and, and his computational theory. And so they're called Turing machines. Uh, and if you're a computer scientist, you, you struggle through a math class called automata. And automata serves to look at a problem and decide if that problem is easy, hard, or impossible for a computer to solve. Uh, the unsolvable problems are called undecidable. And the most famous of those is called the halting problem. I, I will read to you what the halting problem says, and then I'll try to give you a, a easier description of it. Let N be an arbitrary Turing machine with an alphabet sigma, and let omega be an, uh, an element of sigma star. Will M halt when begun on the input string of omega? So what it's saying is if I have a computer and I feed that computer as input a program and input to that program, will the computer be able to tell me if that program will halt, just stop on that input? Not will it get the right answer. It just wants to know, is it ever gonna finish processing? And it turns out that this problem is not solvable by any computer, regardless of the amount of processors you have or memory you have or power that you have. And the reason it's not solvable is if you feed the computer the program and you feed the computer the input and it stops, then you have your answer. But if it doesn't stop, you don't know if it just needs more time or does it need more memory or is it never going to stop? And so you end up with this kind of logical fallacy where you get one answer, but you never get the other. And the problem is that a lot of the questions that we ask in cybersecurity are analogous to the halting problem. Uh, and because the halting problem is undecidable, the way that we kind of cheat around it is we start making assumptions. And some of the assumptions are good and some of them are not so good, but regardless, those assumptions will lead to false positive and false negative errors. Now, false uh, negatives means that there's no entry in the log and there probably should be. So we're gonna uh, ignore those for now. Let's talk about the false positive. That's when you get a signature fire and you get a log entry and now you need an analyst to go look at that log entry and go, was this actually an exception to our policy or not? And so that's what we're really looking at here. So why can we not solve that 
uh, cybersecurity problem. Well, let's let's pretend that we could develop a Turing machine that would detect all zero days. And there are lots of vendors that will tell you that they can do that uh, and they can't, they're, they're lying. Uh, and so I'm gonna come up with a computer and I'm gonna say that anything that is not a zero day is equivalent to a halt. And anything that is a zero day exploit is equivalent to a non halt. And I'm gonna take that algorithm and I'm gonna put it in, a, in an ASIC and a small computer chip. And then I'm gonna use that to solve the halting problem. And now we have a logical contradiction. I know I can't solve the halting problem. So if I can resolve, if I can use the zero day detection problem to solve the halting problem, that means I also can't solve the zero day detection problem. So we will never, ever, ever be able to solve that zero day detection problem. We are always gonna have type one and type two errors. We're always gonna have long entries that have to be reviewed by human beings, regardless of AI. But let's talk about AI. Artificial intelligence is amazing and wonderful. And if you've been in this field long enough, uh, you will realize that artificial intelligence is the flying car of computer science. We're always just 10 years away. Uh, this is an article on the state of the art artificial intelligence system for detecting cyber attacks that was built by MIT. And it's called AI2. Uh, and so they released an article that said that they can detect 85% of attacks. I think they're up another 2% now, 87% of attacks. Uh, and 87 is pretty good if you're taking a hard class, but if you're protecting mission critical infrastructure, knowing that 13% of your attacks go undetected isn't great. So I talked about the halting problem and the zero day detection problem. So how can they say that they detect 85%? So you go and you pull up the page in the study and it says that AI2 works by presenting its findings to human analysts. And the human analyst decides if these are real events and they, or they are not. And then they just inform the AI. So we're still back to humans analyzing these log entries. And we've already talked about there are not enough humans and there never will be for the number of log entries that we have. So what I'm telling you is no amount of sensors, no amount of AI, no amount of big data is ever really gonna tr truly solve this problem for us. So let's talk about frameworks. Now frameworks sometimes are the regulatory, sometimes they're legal, oftentimes they're best practices. Um, we've got lots of them, whether you're using ISO 27001, whether you're using the risk mitigation framework, COBIT or any other, they're supposed to work this way. At the organizational level, you're supposed to have these big strategic goals. At the operational level, they're going to uh, examine how they operate those goals uh, and what information is critical and when it's critical. And then they're going to tell the information systems. And that's what the information systems are going to monitor. And then there's supposed to be this feedback where the information systems explains to the operators what they're monitoring and what they see and the operations explains to the organizational level uh, how it is that they're accomplishing those strategic goals. The reality of the matter is that it never works this way seamlessly. It very rarely works. Somewhere in this cycle, something is broken. And it's typically between operations and information systems because operations typically doesn't care how their data moves through the network or what systems it goes to. They just want their data when they want their data. And the information systems, they're just gonna try to protect everything from everybody all of the time, which is why we end up with too many uh, log entries. And there's another problem. As we go through and we design our networks, uh, we have to decide what's actually mission critical and what is not. Uh, and so this comes from uh, the risk mitigation life cycle from the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. And so we take a look at the system and categorize its criticality. So the way that you do that, if you look at the equation of the type, the security criticality uh, is based upon a ceiling function of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And so you take a look at those three principles and they're looked at as either low, medium, or high impact. Uh, low impact would have uh, minimal effects on the operations if compromised. Uh, medium impact would have significant and a high impact would have catastrophic uh, consequences. And so you may decide that confidentiality is high and integrity and availability are low, but you still have to take the highest level. So in this case, it's high and you have to monitor confidentiality, integrity and availability at high impact because one of those things was high. And that's gonna to lead to the selection of your security controls. And each of those controls is gonna have their own log entries and their own information that you're gonna output. You're gonna implement those security controls. You're gonna uh, assess them for effectiveness 
uh, and then you're going to monitor them for exceptions to your policy, uh, and then you feed back in and re uh, recategorize those systems. So again, you're supposed to periodically do this, but the problem here is we take the worst case scenario for one item and we make that system that highest uh, category for, for all things for all time. Here's another pr problem. When we go through and we uh, decide what security controls that we need, um, they're broken out into families. Uh, and if you look at these, some of these are very easy to tell which security uh, principle they protect. You know, access control probably protects confidentiality. Does it protect integrity? Well, arguably. Does it protect availability? Sure. What about media protection? What does that protect? Does that protect confidentiality, integrity, or availability? So already we've kind of lost the bubble in the connection when we've implemented these security controls to what's actually needed for the business function. And so these risk mitigation frameworks, these cybersecurity frameworks, they're great to use as kind of uh, making a, a pre-made cake, right? If you're starting at nothing and it gives you some ideas of things to look at, but it's very easy to lose the connection between what you're doing and why you're doing it. So what I'm saying is neither the cybersecurity frameworks, nor AI, nor ML, nor any magical sensor or computational power is gonna solve the information overload problem for you. So let's talk about information overload. So information overload very simply is when the amount of information you have to process exceeds your capability to process. And it's gonna exceed your capability process because you do not have enough resources in the time that you need to review that information. Seems fairly straightforward. Uh, so what leads to increases of, of uh, need of information? Well, hierarchical organizations. Uh, and if you're a very small organization of five or six people, you can be completely matrixed. Uh, and that's fine, but at, at some point you're gonna, gonna become hierarchical. Everybody's got a boss, everybody's got a direct report. And so that leads to increased information needs as your boss requires information because her boss requires information because his boss requires information. The next thing that drives increase for information is uncertainty. Well, that's what we do in cybersecurity. We work in uncertainty. Have we been compromised? Have we not? Does this log entry mean that there was a violation of policy? Does it not? Uh, exception conditions. Every log entry is quite possibly an exception to our policy, and it means that we have to start stop doing the routine things and go to kind of an emergent uh, action. Uh, and then the last one, which is a very human con condition, is our inability to recognize our information processing limits. We've all done this. We all go, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read the CISSP book and I'm going to read 150 pages a night. And two months later, we realize we're on page 75. So we all do that. We're really bad at looking at ourselves at, at introspection and figure out what our own limits are. So what are the negative effects? Well, the first one is that if you can't process the information qualitatively, it's the same as not having the information at all. Uh, so why collect it if you're not gonna process it? The second one is that information overload leads to techno stress in workers. There's a lot of turnover in cybersecurity. Uh, and that's due to stress. We are constantly stressed in this field. Uh, the last thing is that the more information you have, the more likely it is that you're going to have irrelevant information, and that leads to its own issues. Uh, if you have increased quantities of irrelevant information, it reduces your ability to make decisions effectively and make the correct decisions. Worse, it increases your confidence in your incorrect decisions when you make them. And then uh, logically, also, as you analyze more information or as you read more information, you have reduced time to think, analyze, and contemplate and really think about what does this information mean, what does it tell me, and then make the uh, corresponding correct decision. So problem summary, uh, it's, it's a bit dark and, and uh, self-defeatist. Uh, computer science and AI are going to be limited by the limits of Turing machines. Uh, risk mitigation frameworks are based on a worst case scenario and drive us to have more information that we might need uh, and exacerbate the information overload problem. There's a lack of linkage between core mission functions and operational needs and the cybersecurity controls we implement on our networks. Uh, there's no consideration for information in context of the business and of the operational environment in a unit of time. Uh, organizational theory and information overload, 
there's only so much we can do there. We're, we're going to continue to operate in uncertainty. And there's going to always be a decision uh, desire for decision makers to get more information than they absolutely need. Why do they want that? Well, some of them want it to be more sure of the decision they're making. Um, some of them want it to make themselves feel better. Some of them want it because they collect more information uh, or because they're afraid to make a decision. But most of us uh, ask for more information than we really need for the task at hand. So in a very simple picture, if the dotted line is the amount of confidentiality, integrity, and availability uh, on a network, and that uh, solid blue box is what our analysts can actually do, we're asking them to do this much. And we just can't get there. And this problem is going to get worse. That red box is going to get bigger, and the tiny blue box is going to get smaller. So we have to come up with a new model to do that. The, the model that we're using isn't going to work. So I decided to take a look at this by examining a real world problem. And the first question is, well, gee, what kind of network are you gonna look at? Well, first I decided to do a process flow analysis. So starting up at the top, you've got network traffic. We can't affect that because our networks are getting bigger. Our pipes to the internet are getting bigger. As the networks get bigger, we get more network sensors. More network sensors mean that we're gonna have more fires. Uh, and more signatures and more log entries, and those things are going to get fed into our, our SIM or our SOAR, uh, and so we can't affect that. What we can affect is the amount of information our sensor intelligence, our SIM and our SOAR, presents to the human analysts. So how do we actually do that? Well, here's an intuition, as, as uh, Ed mentioned, I'm a former military officer. Uh, and so we had this concept of key terrain in the military. And if you're a history buff uh, and you know anything about World War II, you'll know that France had this line of defenses between themselves and Germany called the Maginot Line. And they considered it key terrain. They had to hold that line. And if they held that line, Germany could not invade France and France would be safe. So the question is, when did the Maginot Line quit being key terrain? Well, the answer is when the Germans went around the Maginot Line through Belgium into France, all of a sudden there's a bunch of Frenchmen defending the Maginot Line and that's not where the adversary is. So cybersecurity needs to protect the network, not for the sake of protecting the network, but they need to protect the network for the sake of operations and core business functions. We need to always tie it back to that. And what is key cyber terrain is going to change based upon what your core business functions are, what jobs you have to execute, and where you are in the execution of those jobs. And so that's what I chose to take a look at. So the network I looked at supports roughly 5,000 users. Uh, it's got both uh, information technology and operations technology. It's got legacy systems that go back 50 years. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of issues with that legacy tech. Uh, it supports operations for a small regional airport. Uh, the customer that owns that network has absolutely no tolerance for failure whatsoever, uh, but they have very well uh, documented operational requirements and service level agreements. So that makes things a little bit easier. And if you haven't figured out what kind of network I'm talking about, I'm talking about the network on a U.S. Navy uh, nuclear aircraft carrier. Uh, and so that's the reality of the networks that these uh, these carriers are in, they have very limited amount of personnel on their, uh, on their SOC, the Security Operations Center. And so I decided to take a look at that. Uh, so the way that this worked is they have a predefined list of mission essential tasks. Those are the core business functions at business speak. And as part of that, it says, under what conditions do those tasks have to be completed? And how long do those tasks have to be completed? Uh, and, and what is the success rate gotta be? So those are your service level agreements. So instead of going to the cybersecurity and networks personnel, I went to the operational subject matter experts and I said, hey, listen, when you do this task, what do you need? Uh, and then I normalized the results uh, across a 30 day period. Now, what does that mean? There are some tasks that were conducted only once every 30 days. There were some tasks that were conducted every 24 hours. And so I wanted to make sure that in a 30 day period, if the task took 10 minutes, but it got, had to be done every day in a 30 day period, then I counted for 300 minutes as opposed to a task that you only did once, but it required a hundred minutes. Uh, and then I graph the results to determine the amount of information that was actually required, the minimum information required to complete those mission essential tasks. And what that means is those minimum requirements 
Anything below that is unacceptable risk because it may and likely will result in the inability to complete a core business function. So uh, I, I took all of the tasks and I broke them up into four phases just for uh, ease of conversation. The first one is preparation. Uh, so let's say we're going to go shopping for Amazon. Uh, preparation are all the things that you do and prepare to uh, go execute that task. So your, your task today is to go buy a new server. Your preparation might be to do research on Dell and Amazon and IBM and, and figure out what the prices are uh, and figure out what the uh, specs are and maybe try to figure out what the customer actually needs. Then there's the execution, which is the actual performing of that task. So now we're going to actually go out and buy that server. Then there's that monitoring, and we're all familiar with that monitoring when we've ordered a new toy. We've executed the task, we've bought the server, but now we're waiting for it to get in. So we're clicking update on the uh, DHL uh, delivery page constantly to see when is this thing gonna actually get delivered so we can complete the task. Uh, and then there's a steady state, which is a catch-all for any other uh, time period not covered by preparation, execution, and monitoring. Uh, and so took a series of tasks. I talked to the operations department and I talked to the logistics department on a carrier to figure out what their individual departmental needs were. Uh, very simply, this is how I went out and did it. This was a, uh, a handwritten form. I went out and I said very simply, uh, in 30 day period, how long you spend in, in uh, preparation, execution, monitoring and steady state for these tasks. And in the preparation phase, what percentage of time do you need confidentiality, integrity and availability? So very simple to understand numbers. Notice I asked about the mission. The only cybersecurity part about this was what are confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and that was defined for them. So I'm not asking about IPs or SIMs or firewall logs or signatures or ROP chains. I'm asking them about what their core business function is and what do they need in order to complete it. So to some extent, it doesn't matter what the core business tasks are. You should figure out what those core business tasks are for your company, but I will go over what they are just so it makes it easy to explain. On the y-axis, you'll see that it goes from zero to 720. Uh, 720 is the number of hours that you have in, in a month. And on the x-axis, you'll see that I have the preparation, execution, monitoring, and steady state phase. And the different color lines tell you which security principle I'm looking at. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now, the first thing to notice here is that there's very little that's needed. Out of 720 hours, it looks like the need here is if we execute roughly 40 hours out of a month, which means that the rest of the time I can literally shut off or not monitor the system that does this and I can still meet the mission of uh, task. Now the task in this case was to transport and or provide for uh, casualty or patient evacuation. This is not a task that you execute every day. This is an emergent task that you may execute sometimes and you're not sure when. So this is one of those cases where it's an exception. It's not something you do every day. Uh, and so that you would imagine that that would drive up the information need. And what we're hearing is, look, we need availability, uh, but we don't need a lot of it. Uh, we need integrity and we need confidentiality, but we don't need a lot of it. So uh, this is from the operations perspective. What do you think it is from the logistics perspective? Well, the logisticians don't have to do a whole lot of this. So their shape and their needs are a little bit different. Uh, you'll notice that what they need is more at the tail end. And that's because as they do this casualty eva uh, evacuation, they're gonna need to know, well, what did we expend? How much fuel did we expend? How many people are gone from the ship? Um, because they need to reorder and account for that information. Uh, but again, you'll notice here that the logisticians need no confidentiality, zero. Why do they need no confidentiality? Well, if you're ordering fuel or if you're ordering food, the vendors don't operate on a classified network. And so it's not gonna be a secret when they load up the gas tanker to come out to meet the ship that they're bringing out fuel or when the ship pulls into a pier and a gas truck uh, pulls up that they're ordering fuel. They need a little bit of confidentiality just to send the payment information, but really that's it, it's minuscule. So monitoring confidentiality on these systems may be a complete waste of your time. Uh, this is a completely different task. This is one that happens almost every day on a carrier. This is one of the things that they produce. 
uh, on an aircraft carrier, and those are daytime helicopter operations. Uh, the, that is one of the widgets they produce on a carrier. And not surprisingly here, you see that they need uh, the network about 40% of the time. Now for operations in preparation for launching helicopter operations, they don't need a whole lot. Why? Well, the helicopter's still there on the ship and the pilot's still there on the ship. And so we don't have to use the networks a whole heck of a lot. But when that helicopter is up, we need a fair amount of confidentiality so that our orders are secret to the pilots. Uh, and we need some amount of integrity and some amount of availability. So the question then becomes, well, why is integrity and availability not as important as confidentiality? Well, the reason for this is simple. We don't send a lot of complex messages to our pilots via our IT systems, and our pilots are pretty smart. Uh, and so if they get a garbled message or they get a message that doesn't make sense, they can very quickly come back and say, hey, can you repeat that? I didn't get it. Uh, and then as the... Uh, helicopter launches, which is kind of the critical function as they get closer to, you know, monitoring the, the flight, uh, their needs decrease because there's not as much interaction that's necessary. Uh, and then the requirements go away once the helicopter lands back on deck. So that's from an operations perspective. What do we think it looks like from a logistics and supply perspective? Well, it looks vastly different. Uh, you'll see that, again, they have no need for confidentiality, right? Minimal need. Um, they have a need for some integrity. They want to make sure that they order the right parts and the right fuel. Uh, what they need is they need a lot of availability, but that's at the tail end. That's during the monitoring phase because they're monitoring to see, hey, listen, how, you know, how many resources did we expend? Did something break that we have to order parts for? Uh, and, and so they're monitoring for what's being expended on the mission so that they can go ahead and pre-order those supplies for that next widget that we're going to create that's a daytime helicopter operation. Uh, here's another one that happens on a fairly routine basis, but it happens at a much faster interval. Uh, and this is another thing that gets produced on an aircraft carrier, and this is a combat air patrol. This is the thing, this is the primary purpose of the aircraft carrier. It happens day in and day out. Most people on board can do it with their eyes shut. There are lots of processes that you do in your business that are it's the same thing you do day in and day out, and everybody knows their part, and it's a well-oiled machine. And you'll see here that even though it sounds like launching helicopters and launching airplanes would be the same, that the requirements here are actually less for aircraft, for fixed-wing aircraft, than they are for helicopters. Why is that? Well, we launch a lot more air, uh, planes than we do helicopters, and so we're better at it. Uh, and so you'll see that it's a somewhat similar shape to what we had for helicopters. Uh, we do require confidentiality, but there is less of a need for integrity and availability, uh, again, because our, our pilots are smart. And you'll notice that there's even a more severe drop in the amount of availability that's required during the monitoring phase here than there was for helicopters. So not surprisingly, again, from the supply and logistics, we've got this characteristic tail bump um, at the end when they're monitoring. And again, they're monitoring for what was expended. What do I need to reorder? What broke? What supply parts am I going to need? And what they need is primarily availability, little to no confidentiality, and they need some integrity. But again, even in a worst case scenario, realize that we're just under 50% here. That means that we can cast out wholesale 50% of the information that we're monitoring on our networks and still achieve the mission critical task. Uh, here's one that doesn't happen very often, uh, and it's a very, very slow process. In, in this case, it's it's detecting uh, uh, and, and uh, tracking submarines. Um, we've all got these tasks that are kind of low and slow. We do them infrequently. Uh, just because they take a long time doesn't mean that there's a lot of need for it. Um, and, and what I mean by that is needs to support the completion of the task. Uh, and so what you'll see here is, you know, this task happens so rarely in a 30-day period that what we need primarily is availability, uh, and we need uh, availability one-seventh of the time, one out of seven hours. Basically, we need one hour a shift. Uh, so the rest of the time, these systems could essentially be off, or the logging could be off, uh, and we could still accomplish the task. Now, just to clarify, I'm not advocating that you not log these things. Log everything. But what I am advocating is... Maybe you don't want to send all of this information through your SEM to your analyst. You only want to send them the information that's most relevant to protect that core business function. 
Um, so here's another one for uh, the the other department. And again, you'll see that the tasks aren't uh, aren't very uh, aren't very needy. They don't have a lot of requirements. Again, we're looking at needing confidentiality about a third of the time. Uh, this one is interesting. Uh, this one is interesting because it happens very infrequently, uh, but it absolutely positively must be correct. Uh, and this is when we, in the Navy, when we employ a weapon system, when we actually drop a torpedo, we want to make sure we're going to hit the right target. That, that's kind of important. We end up if, with bad news otherwise. Um, but because it happens so infrequently, you'll see that the needs aren't uh, all that great. So one of the kind of surprising ones for me, but it makes sense, is that when dropping a weapon, when employing a weapon system, there's very little need for confidentiality. And I thought, well, yeah, as soon as you drop that torpedo, everybody sees it and everybody that's got sonar can hear it. And so it's not a surprise. Uh, so there's no point in, in keeping that confidential. Uh, but we absolutely want to make sure that before we drop that, that weapon in the water, that we have good integrity uh, and then we have good availability. Uh, again, when you go to logistics, they don't care too much about their execution. What they care about is during the monitoring phase, right? So in this case, uh, just to kind of uh, overemphasize it, you know, if the first torpedo didn't work during the monitoring phase, we're going to drop a second torpedo. So now they're going to have to order two torpedoes. And so that is something that they want to monitor. Uh, but again, this is an infrequent task that has a high criticality and then requirements to ensure that it happens successfully are still very, very small. Uh, the last one I'll talk about is, uh, is another one uh, that happens very infrequently and is unplanned uh, and is uh, something that frankly, uh, most businesses are gonna have to deal with at some point. And it's somewhat akin to uh, having a breach and that's emergency repairs to equipment uh, critical to the mission. Right. Uh, for a lot of companies, that network is critical to the mission. If you have a breach, you need to repair it and you need to repair it right now. Uh, so for operations, uh, they have a lot of needs during the execution of those repairs. Uh, and those needs die down a little bit as they monitor to make sure that those repairs really took hold. OK, um, but again, it's not terribly high uh, for supply and logistics. Uh, again, there's a little bit more need during the execution because they're watching it and it's emergent and it's mission critical. And so they may have to add uh, some things to the fixes. They may have to order specialists or they may have to order personnel or they may have to order supplies. Uh, and they're very keen to monitor how those repairs are going so that as you go through and you do these repairs, you're not wanting for, for something that you actually need. Uh, and again, even in this case, you only need it about a third of the time. You need a, a availability a third of the time. You need no confidentiality uh, and very little integrity. Again, because everybody's right there, you can pick up the phone, you can go down the hall and, and go to the next cubicle and talk to that person. So what are the conclusions and takeaways? Uh, well, looking at this analysis, I, I looked at six, six tasks. I did 12 analyses across two uh, departments. Uh, and all of the results were statistically significant at a 95% confidence interval. Most of them were within one third of a standard deviation. And it worked regardless of task, regardless of department, regardless of the execution phase, uh, and regardless of that task was something that we do normally, or it's something that happens only in exigent circumstances. The absolute minimal information load reduction was 50%. And in many cases, it was much higher. In many cases, two thirds of the information that we're capable of collecting is simply not needed to ensure the completion of that task on our network. And so what this lends to is that you can develop your own risk framework by talking to your operational subject matter experts about what it is that they need to do to do their job. Now, that doesn't mean that this is an easy discussion. Oftentimes when you go to the user and you go, what do you need? They'll tell you what they want. Uh, I want PowerPoint and I want unfettered access to the internet. I went, okay, well, we have to walk it back and go, okay, this is a core business function that you do. What are, you, what are the minimum requirements that you need for, for this? Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So by, by understanding this, by using this framework, what it allows CISOs to do is do something that we're really bad at, which is 
actually get quantitative measures of performance. No kidding, hard numbers. We know that we need 200 hours of integrity and that needs to be monitored uh, by personnel. And we know how much personnel can monitor in a given period. And so now we know how many people we need to get that threshold uh, and make sure that we're not down below the curve in unacceptable risk. It will show us where we have shortfalls of personnel, not just that we have shortfalls, but how many personnel we actually need. And you actually have math to go back to the CFO or the COO uh, or the CEO and go, here's the math based upon our core business functions for why I need 25 more people. By the way, that's just to get us over the hump of acceptable, unacceptable risk. If you want to add another 10 to 15% of that, here's how many personnel I need. And you've got hard numbers and number of person hours of work uh, that you can present. So key takeaways, uh, don't try to defend everything from everybody all the time, that's not going to work. Uh, you need to understand not just your network, but your company's essential tasks and core business functions and how they're executed. You need to be realistic about your cybersecurity requirements. I think Liz mentioned, uh, and I'm sure I, she's not the only one, that everybody's going to have an incident sooner or later. Uh, be realistic about which instances are the most damaging and you're going to want to see first and be willing to accept some risk elsewhere. Uh, understand acceptable and unacceptable risk. Uh, realize that as a CISO, that's not your decision. Your, your job as a CISO is to explain to the board, to explain to the other leaders in the company what their risk profile currently is and ask them if that's acceptable or unacceptable and then help them get it to the acceptable level if it's not there. And the next thing is that you need to review uh, how this happens on a yearly basis at least, uh, probably quarterly and definitely if you make changes to your infrastructure. If your workflow changes, if your information flow changes, if your infrastructure changes, you probably need to go back and revalidate that you're monitoring the right things on the right systems for the appropriate amount of time. So that is all I have pending questions. Uh, well, Pablo, this was, uh, this was a lot of information. Um, let, let me see if I understand because this is, uh, wow. Um, so one of the main points is that we need to understand our environment in order to secure it. We need to understand our business functions. The, business the network is, cybersecurity is not there to protect the network for the sake of the network. Cybersecurity is there to protect the network for the sake of the business and the business accomplishing its core business functions. Okay. So if we can't tie what we're doing on the network and why we're monitoring something on the network to a, a business need, then we're, we're doing it wrong. And, and this is something that uh, this activity about getting to know the business is something that is very important for the CISOs. I know uh, Ian Amit, for example, he said when he began, became the CISO at his current company, one of the first things he did is visit leaders of each business function, speak with them so that they would, he would understand what are their business requirements. Um, and that's exactly what you're saying. And not only does that allow you to, as a CISO, to understand the business better, it also establishes the um, communication, nexus communications, right, between you and different business leaders, which is extremely important. Absolutely. And, and once you understand the core business function, that will lend you to some insights so you can ask those business leaders better questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and those business leaders will become better about uh, asking you for things. They'll ask for things that are more realistic and they'll be able to explain better why they need those things for the business. Right. As you said, if you go and you say to them, what is it that you need? They're going to tell you what they want, which is, <laughs> it's, not, it's not the same thing. It's up to us to make sure that they understand that. Right. Um, now, you made a statement at the beginning that it said that in cybersecurity, we live in uncertainty. And we're like Schrodinger's Basically, we, we've been hacked, but we don't know if we've been hacked until we look at the logs to tell us, hey, you've been hacked. 
Oh, it's worse than that. Yeah, but yes, I like the Schrodinger's cat analogy. Uh, I challenge uh, any CISO or any CIO to go into a company with existing infrastructure and definitively state that they are not currently hacked. Um, I talked about false positives and false negatives, right? So you've got uh, false positives are when you get a log entry and it's not an actual incident. A false negative is when you get no log entry and you probably should have because there's a hacker on your network. Okay. Um, and, and so, uh, you don't ever really know, right? You can, you yeah. can see indication. It's, it, it's a bit like the halting problem. Yeah. If you're hacked and you know it, you know that you've been hacked, but you can't know that you've not been hacked. Exactly. Uh, so it's, it's a very difficult decision. Uh, and it's an education decision. We're, we're getting better about educating businesses as to what CISOs can and can't do and what's a real, like a realistic expectation. Uh, I think any CISO worth their salt, um, considers themselves really a, a, a technical leader and a risk advisor. Uh, we can't be all things to all people and, and no CISO is going to sign up for, I can absolutely guarantee you we'll never have an incident because that's, that's a sure way to end up out of a job. It's really about here's the risk you're accepting uh, and getting uh, the business leadership down to what they consider acceptable risk. And, and, and that's a, a, a balance that all CISOs have to work, right? I mean, because uh, one of the statements was uh, the negative effect of, inf of information overload, right? Uh, you're going to burn out. You get too many things to look at. And things that cannot be processed is, is, the, same as not, is, is the same as not collecting? Yes. If it cannot be processed, it's the same as not collecting. But a lot of the time, a lot of these industries, health, um, you know, you, you, you're federal, you have to meet strict requirements where they tell you what are your controls for all of this NIST 50, you know, 853, right? You have to have all of those controls. So now you're complicating and now, and then monitoring, you have to have all these sensors, all these things, and you have to collect all this information, like it or not. So how do you deal with that? No, you know what? That's a great question. Allow me to clarify that so that okay. there's not a confusion. You absolutely have these requirements, regulatory requirements, NIST 800, TAC 53. You've got PCI DSS. You've got GDPR. You've got the California uh, Consumer Protection Act. You've got, uh, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley. They're going to tell you what controls you need, and you're going to have to collect that yeah. because it's a regulatory requirement. But you're only, if you're not processing it, it's not going to help you detect that you have a compromise. Right. It's only going to help you once you detect that you've been compromised via other methods. And then you can go back and look at that information at, in post-mortem to figure out, well, what happened? And that's useful, but we can't really say that it's being used to protect the network. It's going to be used as a post-mortem after the network has been hacked. There you go. There you go. Two different things. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's what I have. Um, so really, really good. I was interested in the uh, the machine learning and the AI because, as we all know, AI is as good as the information that you feed it. Yeah. So there's a human element in there. You don't feed the right information, you don't get the right answers. No, exactly. And, and what happens is uh, reading logs, if you've never read logs, uh, and, and gosh, I hope if you're a CISO, you've read logs, uh, you'll know how tedious and boring it is. It is, it is not a fun job. Um, and it is easy to kind of go snow blind and just see, you know, the matrix with all the, the letters and the IP addresses coming. And you just don't see it. You just click, no, this is fine. No, this is fine. No, this is fine. And then that hundredth time that it comes across and the time you have a real incident you're not paying attention you click no this is fine and now you've trained the ai that oh it's fine for me to have this backdoor on the network <laughs> it's you know it's it it's fine for people to be using facebook on a on a classified network or you know it's fine for people to be hooking up a uh, external drive to my mail server it's probably not okay but you just missed it because it's just repetitive emotion. We get bored, we get tired, we get frustrated, we make mistakes. Absolutely. And, and last one question, because this is our curiosity. How long do you think, how long did it take you the process of collecting that information with the surveys? So I spent um, about a year collecting the surveys and, and honing the surveys and looking at it. And, and to be fair, um, 
I did not get through all the tasks. The I, I got through six tasks uh, on uh, on five aircraft carriers, and the reality is, if I look at the book for what are the core business functions and mission essential tasks for an aircraft carrier, it's about 400 pages long. Hmm. Now, some of those are repeated. So let's say it's a quarter of that. It's 100 pages of tasks. So I, I did not get to all of it. I just validated this model could work yeah. uh, and can work and, and can reduce your information overload. Perfect. So yeah, again, it's... Uh you know, how much effort you put into something. And I just wanted to make sure, I always ask that question, how long did it take you? Because that way we have an idea what we're, what, what we're you know, looking at and what we're working with. So. so it took me, once I collected the data, I, there was probably about five months of doing analysis using, you know, big data and I and, uh, didn't use any ML. I did use a little bit of, of AI and data science. Okay. Um, so yeah, it is not a trivial process, uh, but what's sure is we can't continue to defend networks the way we have been. Uh, we, we just can't grow cybersecurity professionals at the rate that we're growing our networks. Perfect. Okay. Well, Pablo, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo, for your amazing pres presentation. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for being here. So, Salma. Well, we are, we are finishing our Tactical Tuesday. Tactical <laughs> Tuesday, that's right. Uh, and then we got to come up with the one for tomorrow, uh, tactical, whatever it's going to be. But uh, yeah, it's been a really good day. Thank you, everyone. Um, really, really good presenters today. Wendy Nather, Stephen Moore, Liz uh, Wharton, and, uh, and obviously Dr. Pablo Brewer. Uh, tomorrow we start again, same time, same bat channel, um, 9 a.m. Central. And uh, I think our first guest is going to be uh, Andy Ellis, a CSO of Akamai, uh, and then followed by uh, Brandon uh, Treffenstedt. I have to remember how to pronounce his last name from uh, CyberArk. And then in the afternoon, we have uh, the most famous llama of InfoSec, Jerry Bell. And we close it with uh, Mitch Parker, CISO at Indiana University Health. So it's like, how do we do it today? And then the next day is like, wow, you know, we have fantastic speakers. Every so. day is getting better and better <laughs> and more surprises. <laughs> more surprises. So everyone, thank you so much. Please visit our sponsors. Yeah interact with them, let them know that you love them. I love my sponsors. Um, so thank you to uh, Ativo Networks, to Cellpoint, Exabeam, and CyberArk. And Pablo, again, thank you. And uh, everyone, have a good night. Have a good night. Have a good night. See you tomorrow. Yes. Bye.